Thank you so much for coming to the first ever Tamid Strategy Session for Success. As you're all aware, the weather did not make it easy to pull off this event. However, through the hard work of the whole Tamid team, we're able to do it not once, but twice. I just wanted to start off by giving a special thank you to Shir Ben Shushan, Maddie Pawlowski, Hesko Hankashi, and Zoe Glaba for their countless hours of hard work over the past few months, and especially during the crunch time of the last few days. I also want to thank everyone who came here tonight to help make this event and to me a success. First, I'd like to thank Matt Liebvik and Matt Hoffman, both of Combined Jewish Philanthropy, for their unwavering support and encouragement over the past year and a half. We value the friendship and relationship that we have developed. I also want to give a special thanks to our advisor, Annette McBride, Professor McCarthy, who has been a true partner to Tamid since the very beginning, Dean Elmore, Dean Reiser, and Dean Freeman for all joining us tonight. I would also like to thank all the professors and faculty that have taken the time out of their busy schedule to be in attendance. Thank you so much for helping make Tamid at BU a success. Finally, I would like to thank the whole Tamid team for their hard work and dedication. To see our group grow to 26 dedicated, active members in such a short time has been one of the most amazing journeys I have ever had the privilege of being part of. Great, so the timeline for tonight's event. David will kind of explain more about the history of our chapter, and then Shira, Roy, and Zoe will go into a little bit more. And then Professor McCarthy will kind of moderate and just strategize. So we're excited for <laughs> that part. Um, we've been kind of brainstorming with him for about maybe a month or two now of like what would be the best way to kind of you know have you guys involved, get your feedback, um, and then use it for the upcoming year. So thank you, David. Thank you. Um, we just, you know, we know that some of uh, people in the room have had different experiences to me, so we just sort of um, are going to go through a little bit about our journey for a second. And, um, you know, it actually started about 18 months ago that I was randomly contacted by David and asked him to help start the Tamid chapter at Boston University. Um, David and I did not know each other at the time. Uh, we didn't know each other very well back then. And at first I was confused and I really couldn't actually figure out his motives. <laughs> it was fate that I was randomly staying in Los Angeles, which is David's hometown, when he contacted me. After I proposed we meet up, he explained to me his idea for the Israel Business Club. As we spoke, I did not fully understand what he was trying to start at the time. What I did understand that this was someone who had a burning desire to make a lasting impact at the university. And it was this burning desire, this passion, and this passion alone, which is what made me agree to help him start the Timmy chapter in August 2013. When we got back to campus a few weeks later, I met the ex other executive board slash founding members, Rafi, Shira, and Haskell. Those were the days analogous to a new startup. We were a small group, semi-directionalist, idealistic, and motivated. We worked hard to lay down the foundation that would create a lasting student group at BU that could stand the ever-changing cycle of membership that occurs at a four-year university. Back then, Tamid was still just this vision that we all shared, but this vision was what made the five of us a very close family. It was after the success of our first event, Inside the Box, last November, that we knew it was now time to expand our small close family. We interviewed and brought on eight new directors to be the driving force that we were missing. The group expanded, adding new benefits and challenges, but we never lost focus of keeping the close family atmosphere we had created. We tasked the new directors to create their own event, which featured Consulate General of Israel to New York, Ido Aharoni, our goal was to give the new directors the same experience the five of us had when creating Inside the Box, therefore giving them the same shared experience and feeling of success, which made the original board so close. Finally, after a full 12 months of preparation, we opened up applications and interviewed for the first ever Tamid class, of, uh, all of class of Tamid. We accepted members, 13 members who last semester completed a full Tamid educational program, which featured business skills, consulting, investing, and fundraising. Expanding the group once again came with a whole new set of benefits and challenges, as our close group of 13 now learned how to become a close group of 26. This group of 26 is now working on three consulting projects for Israeli startups, and as a team of five working on learning the skills to invest in Israeli stocks. You are about to hear from three members of Tamid, one from each of the three generations I've just mentioned. While each one entered Tamid at a different part in the group's journey, their story is one. Our story is one. This is the story of Tamita Boston University.
Thank you, David. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shira Ben-Shishan, and I've just taken over as the president of Tamid. So after meeting David Dinesh, the former president and founder of Tamid, during the summer before my freshman year, before even stepping foot on the Boston University campus, he called me and asked me to be part of an organization he was starting. All I knew was that it was about business in Israel, and as an incoming business major and a daughter of two Israelis, I jumped at the opportunity. Before school started, David had already compiled an executive board for the club, um, a list of things that we needed to do to get the club started, um, and written up a constitution, none of which made any sense. <laughs> <laughs> Although we had no clue what our mission was and how we'd go about accomplishing it, by the first week of school, we were already meeting and applying to become a recognized club at BU. Not long after school began, we started planning our first event which was held in the auditorium at the School of Management, a very nice but very big room to fill. Professor McCarthy was the mediator for the event, and keynote speaker Jacob Goldenberg discussed the content in his book, Inside the Box. The students listened to the fascinating speech about how one can use limited, in, um, limited resources to be innovative, which encompasses the story of how Israel became the start of the nation. We then gathered in the atrium for our freshmen and with the over 150 students in attendance. Let's just say, for a new student group, this was a huge success. Shortly after, we co-hosted a charity basketball game with our now to meet member, Sam Felder, that raised over $3,000. At the end of the semester, we began accepting applications for the, for the director positions in our club. After carefully analyzing several student resumes, applications and interviews, we accepted eight students on the club's board of directors. The directors didn't have, even have a moment to celebrate before we already started planning our next event, which was held just about one year ago. Although this was just the beginning, the semester was packed. The semester is the foundation for the success that you see here, and, we will, and will be greater explained um, in detail and soon to be released case study. I know some of you got to see it. Um, it's in the front there, there's a draft, so <laughs> take a look if you haven't seen it. So now I would like to introduce Roy Manor, one of the eight directors that were brought on when we expanded our leadership, leadership team last fall. Our current VP of the fund, who will now tell you about his experience with me. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everyone. Are you allowed to respond? Thank you. <laughs> uh, so my name is Roy Manor. I'm the Vice President of the Investment Fund. Uh, so we actually do more than just consulting. So the Investment Fund, um, this is not. <laughs> so the Investment Fund is where members of our group research and analyze publicly traded companies. Uh, and we have a national to meet investing competition with all 24 chapters of to meet across the country. I'm happy to announce that last semester, in a period of uh, just over a month and a half, our fund had a 3% return, uh, which put us in third place amongst the 24 chapters. Um, but today I don't want to bore you by talking about investing. Uh, I actually want to tell you about why I joined Tamid. So I first heard about Tamid in one of my statistics lectures, this crazy person who I think you guys might have heard of. Uh, David Dinesh. Yeah. <laughs> so he got on stage, he started talking about this organization that he's starting. Uh, I had no idea what he was talking about, but it sounded very interesting. And I remember going on a walk with him around Boston, and that was when I realized that he had just as much of a clue as I did about what he wanted me to do, which was zero. <laughs> um, but he had passion for this, and that's when we wanted to join. And after joining, my job was to come up with an education curriculum. Uh, to teach incoming members fundamental finance and investing skills. And that's when I realized how far it is to be a professor. Uh, and after almost a year of preparation, I finally got to teach this investing curriculum to our incoming alpha class members. It was a really good experience and I really enjoyed it. As a chapter, we've had a very successful year and a half. We've managed to grab the attention of people we look up to. Notably, Dean Reiser of the School of Management approached us about coming up with a case study about our successful launch. This case study would allow us to document the process we went through and would serve as a reference to future student leaders and groups. 
We are proud and humbled to have given this opportunity, and this was a big sign for us that we're doing things the right way. This past semester, we officially accepted members to our Olive class. All of these students had to go through a very challenging selection screening process. This process included an application that was longer than a college application, having breakfast at David's apartment, and a formal interview with members of the board. We are thrilled that the 16 members of our Olive class represent some of the best students this university has to offer. Let me give you some statistics about them. Eight of the 16 come from School of Management, two from the College of Arts and Sciences, two from the College of General Studies, two from the College of Engineering, one from Sargent College of Health Sciences, one from the College of Communication. Three out of the 16 are freshmen, seven are sophomores, five are juniors, and one is a senior. Our members come from countries such as Ecuador, Cuba, Canada, India, Colombia, Israel, and the United States. Now I would like to introduce a member of the Olive class who has shown a very impressive initiative in the short few months she's been in this organization and helped prepare this wonderful event. Here's Zoe Glava. Thank you, Roy. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Zoe Glavek, and I'm a freshman in the College of Communication, majoring in advertising. To me, first caught my attention as, a, as an organization that combines Israel and business. To my surprise, it was much more than that. To me, is an organization where new members, such as myself, go through a three-phase program. The first part consists of learning the basics of Israel's business history. We then move on to learning the investing and consulting skills needed to work with Israeli startups and how to invest in the stock market. Members have the chance to either consult for a company or participate in the Tamit Fund competition. The third and final part of Tamit's program is that members can take their experience to Israel and work for Israeli startups through the National Tamit Summer Fellowship. As I mentioned before, I am in the College of Communication and was unsure if I would be able to keep up in a business organization. However, Tamit is not just for business students. The education system was understandable, basic, and fun. The 16 Olive class members were given a book called Startup Nation by Dan Senor and Saul Singer that addresses the question of, how is it that Israel, a country of 7.1 million people, only 67 years old, surrounded by adversity in a constant state of war since its founding, with no natural resources, produces more startup companies than large, stable nations such as Japan, China, Korea, Canada, and the United Kingdom. Our learning started with basic facts about Israel and why that small country is our main focus. After learning about Israel's history and business skills, we started the consulting and investing part of our education. Roy taught investing, which included the basics about stock market trading and how to make predictions about the economy. Roy was able to take such a complex topic and make it so that students with no business background were able to understand concepts such as company valuation and risk analysis. After we finished the investing portion of the curriculum, we continued on to consulting. Andrew Zuckerman, director of consulting, spent two sessions teaching us how to look at and approach questions the way consultants do. Consultants regularly have to answer questions or make predictions based on little or insufficient information. For example, how much hummus does Israel need to support the whole country for one week? <laughs> this methodology trained us to be able to approach any consulting problem we might encounter while consulting for Israeli startups. In addition to the educational component, the curriculum has a crash course in fundraising. This is not only so that Tamid members can raise money for the group, all members are required to raise $200, but also to develop one of the most crucial business skills, to be able to sell oneself and one's organization. With the help of Dean Reiser, who joined us for both of our fundraising workshops, students were able to role play and develop their own personal Tamid pitch. One of the main uses for the money is that four of our members <coughs> will be going to, on the Tamid Summer Fellowship with 80 other Tamid students from the 23 total chapters around the country. For some, this will be their very first time in Israel. Finally, after a year and a half of planning and implementation of this educational curriculum, the BU Tamid chapter will be starting our consulting projects for Israeli startups. 
We have three groups working with Voiceit, the creator of Talkit, an application that works on any computer, smartphone, or tablet for people with speech disabilities that have difficulties being understood. Talkit translates unintelligible pronunciation into comprehensible speech. Currently, the app requires each individual user to input each word into the database in order for the app to calibrate. Both consulting teams will be going into hospitals and clinics in order to collect enough data for patients with different disabilities so that the app will be able to predict their speech with no additional input. This will require taking a sample group of categorized speech impediments and having the participants repeat words or phrases chosen by Talkit. Our fourth consulting project will be a marketing campaign for El Al, the premier Israeli airline to create a plan to promote their new direct flight from Boston to Tel Aviv starting June 28, 2015. This flight was made possible by David Goodtree, the signature speaker at our event, the Boston Israel Connection, this past September, former Governor Duval Patrick, and the New England Israel Business Council, who together have created 6,700 jobs and nearly $6.2 billion in revenue for the state of Massachusetts. This mutually beneficial economic relationship is why a direct flight from Boston to Tel Aviv is so important for Massachusetts in order to continue to grow as a hub for Israeli businesses. The team will be creating a marketing campaign that targets student groups with trips to Israel who can benefit from a faster alternative route. We are extremely excited to get started and make progress. We want to thank everyone so much for being part of this amazing, amazing journey and we hope to have a strong and lasting relationship with all of Boston University. Now Professor McCarthy will come up and mediate this big strategy session. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Well, good evening. I'm Jack McCarthy. I've been asked to help moderate this event. This is a strategy session, and, and we thought that would be helpful for, the, for everyone to hear some stories about how the organization came to be and why some of the members came to be involved. Some of you may know I went to high school not far from here and one of the languages I studied and did not do well in was Latin. And there's a Latin expression, finis origine pendit, which means the end depends upon the beginning. The end depends upon the beginning. And you think about how organizations start and how they grow and how they thrive. And like all of the stories that we were told today, I remember doing a large lecture for 400 SMG and other students, and there was this one kid who would come up at the end of the lecture. Wasn't in my discussion class, and he would pepper me with questions about what I had just said. And he would ask me, and he would, he, every lecture he would come up, this crazy guy, David Dinesh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, why is he coming up? Why isn't he going to his own discussion professor? And then I learned that that's David. That's, it's, it's infectious, that, that he's got this <laughs> zest to learn. And, and if it was anyone else, it would be really annoying, but it wasn't. Because <laughs> uh, it was clear that it was genuine. It was a genuine interest in what was going on. Um, and I can also remember, he'd also give me feedback that this lecture wasn't quite as good as the one before. Um, and he was probably right. So I got to know David, and he said, we're starting this club. And there's lots of clubs here at the university. We're blessed to be at a large university. There's lots of clubs. There's lots of initiatives. Too many, in fact that your biggest challenge will be deciding what not to do, what not what to do. And so figuring out what group to be involved in is a really difficult question. And so as he described his vision for the group, uh, it had much more in my mind to do with community and learning than it did with investments and banking and some other things. That he wanted to create a place that I think <coughs> was a home for you to be connected. And to think about the biggest problem startups have is not starting up, it's continuing. And how do you get to the set, whether it's a family business or a tech business or anything else, it's not the startup that matters, it's the continuation. So I would like to say that this session tonight is not strategies for success, it's strategies for continued success. And so we wanted several people to give you a reason why they've become involved. Um, and I'd like you, each of us to start thinking about why you've become involved, because this is not a random group of people that you weren't invited here, you weren't, you weren't harassed off the tee to come here. You came here because you're all busy people and you wanted to be here. And so I want to start tonight, this session of tonight, by you thinking why you're here. Why you, you, you've got lots of choices. There's lots of other places you could be. But you've chosen to come here. Maybe because, like me, I have a relationship with some of these people and I admire the work that they've done. 
probably one of the most successful student startup organizations uh, in the history of the School of Management, certainly the most successful that I've seen in my tenure in terms of the way it's grown and the way it's been built around community and education and learning with other things like investments and, 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 and typically the core initiatives I think are secondary to the community that you've created. Uh, and secondly, being smart. So as David will sooner or later graduate and we'll be, we'll be free of him at least for a while because I know he'll be <laughs> connected to us, uh, the successor, and I couldn't be happier that Shearer was uh, the next president. And to think about that generation, to have someone like David and someone like Shearer, we're all really lucky because as someone who teaches leadership and someone who talks about character and values, those are the values of your organization. That's the foundation upon which this is built. So that's why I'm here, is to help share that. Uh, you can probably guess from my surname that I have uh, less to do with Israel than maybe some of you uh, here in the room. Um, it has nothing to do for me with faith other than the faith in smart young people doing good things. That's why I'm here. Um, as a small coincidence, I ended up in Israel this summer for the first time, uh, and I met with a, with a fellow named Jacob Goldenberg, uh, who, was one of your, who was your first speaker. And so you think about that connection just over three years and how we're all interconnected. So that's why I'm here. And I'd like to use that as a framework. So what we'd like to do is we're going to have two small informal panel sessions. So in working with David and Shira planning this, I said the last thing you want to do is set up a table that looks like an interrogation. And the last thing you want to do is have it like with a white tablecloth. And I said, because that would be terrible. That would be like the last thing we'd want to do. But looking at the room, there was really no other way to do it. Um, also, Phineas and Regini Penda, you think about the beginning. Why is this castle the way it is? Does anyone know? Why is this, why is this crazy place on campus? It's a beautiful and tragic story. Um, it was built by a Boston industrialist on the turn of the century, um, and, he, and his eldest daughter he viewed as his princess. And she always wanted to be married in a castle. And so he built a castle for her. And she was married here, and then she and her husband left on their honeymoon on a ship called the Lusitania, oh. which was torpedoed and led to the start of World War I, and they both perished. And so later, the family donated this beautiful home to the university. And so having a strategy event here, um, going back to that fairy tale, I think is important uh, to us just to remember space and people and community. So, uh, we're going to have two small panel sessions, and my job, I've already explained to one of the panelists, this is much more, this is going to look a lot more like David Letterman than Meet the Press. Um, <laughs> that, that my job is to kind of keep this moving, um, and I don't want the panelists to do anything other than say why they're here, and I'll just ask a couple leading questions. And I want the group to think about that, because there will be a deliverable at the end, later tonight, maybe tomorrow, we'll send you a survey. And that survey is, what did, you, what did you take away? What idea did this conversation generate? This is supposed to be a conversation. So what did it generate? And I'm going to ask each of you to think about that. And so we have people that are more maybe closer to my age that we thought might be uh, involved in a panel. But we started with the young people and, and have them give you a sense of why they started. And I thought I could give you a little bit of context why I started. Um, and then we'll have a short panel session with four people and then another panel session with three people. Um, and then maybe I'll break you into little groups and I'll have you do a special dance. I'm just kidding about the dance. <laughs> um, but if all goes well, maybe we will do a little dance. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. So to start us off, uh, we have, uh, and, and there's, no, there's no order. The, the second panel is not the beeline. Uh, <laughs> it's not the lesser panel. Uh, but Professor Randall, Professor Siegel, Dean Reiser, and Professor Allen, I would like you to join us for an informal panel discussion. Okay, you passed. So step one was the faculty IQ test. Could they, the faculty need an IQ test, could they array themselves in a way to get into four chairs? So they succeeded with that. So thank you for being part of this panel. Um, I want this to be free-flowing. Maybe I'll start with Professor Randall at the end and just say, why are you here? What brought you to me? What is this organization's strength? And maybe some ideas about keys to success going forward. Well, I think the uh, answer to the first question is probably the reason that most of the people are here, which is David Dinesh, <laughs> <laughs> and why I was my LA245 student uh, a few years ago. Um, and David's enthusiasm for the organization captivated me uh, right from the beginning. He was um, just so enthusiastic and so sincere and so had so much energy 
that I was, I felt this had to be. It's almost wild. overwhelming, isn't it? And <laughs> it's, well, it's, 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 it's a, what, it's a gift. And I think, not to embarrass you in front of everybody here, but I think David really has a gift for connecting people and making, making things happen. Um, and what's been fun for me coming here tonight, I knew a, a few people, Simona, a few other students, uh, people who I knew were part of the group, but I've seen so many faces here, students who I've had or talked to me about taking my class that um, it's just, I feel connected to people here, uh, even though it's my first official to me event. Uh, as I was struck by the uh, listening to the, the three generations speak, that I think one of the challenges, first of all, you, you did a great job of identifying all the issues, I think. You took away half the things I thought I was going to say. But um, one of the, the problems with any organization, any new startup organization, is continuity, is, is succession. And, um, and that, as faculty director of the honors program at the School of Management, this is something that we have been dealing with, is trying to create a culture within the program that um, feels accountable for the organization's success, feels accountable for identifying future members uh, and future leaders of the program. And uh, one of the changes that we have wrought in the program in recent years is to, um, to require that members join as sophomores after their freshman year. So right now we're going through the process of getting uh, uh, applications, reviewing applications, Current honors program members will be interviewing uh, prospective members. There will be a whole process to identify people who want to be part of the program um, because it's something they've affirmatively chosen to do and they've worked to make happen, not because it was given to them because they were so awesome in high school. Um, which is not, which is, you know, there are, we've had some great people from the program selected that way, but it has not been the best way to uh, create sustaining organization. And so one thing that really struck me is that the members here are here because they want to be. This was not, you know, you didn't do this just because your friend said, hey, come to this meeting tonight. But everybody worked to be here. And I think that's a tremendous strength that you have, is that you have, you have this rigorous process that you put members through. Um, and that, I think, is half the battle, is having people who have committed themselves already to being part of this group and are already invested in, in its success. That doesn't end the problem of succession, but I think it gives you a, a great leg up, and I think it's important to continue to identify that um, as, a, as a method of, of growing over the years. Um, that's enough for me. So. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff, you want to, uh, Professor Allen, you want to jump in and, and well, maybe your perspective? For me, I, I knew both Shira uh, and Madison and had met David before in a class that I had, uh, the uh, core class, but I'm all about passion, right? And people who are passionate about what they're doing. I call it the three P's. It's passion, purpose, and people. And that's really what it's all about. So I think that one part of being a student is trying to find your passion. Uh, in general, most people can't quite tell you exactly what they want to do, but through experience, you can finally surely figure out what you don't want to do. So groups that have a passion, who have a purpose, and are all about bringing people together, that usually inspires me. So the reason I'm here is that I'm all about people and passion and purpose. And I can see that from my conversation with Shira Madison uh, and David in my core class. And I thought, uh, hey, let me come and uh, learn and be part of the process. Well, we're delighted you could. And when we go to events, there's been several events that have been held, there's that same feeling uh, you know, of, of connection and passion. So I, I echo those. And Dean Reiser. It's hard being third in line because all my talking points are gone. By the time we get to you, there's going to be nothing novel to say. Um, I, I, I think I think I and this has been said like many people are here because uh, of really that interpersonal connection, right, with David and all of you. Um, I think that speaks very much to how much you all have done in sort of cultivating relationships with each other, but with others around uh, the university community. I was struck during the earlier comments by a few things. One is that point of passion. I think that this is a passion project 
um, but but one that often you connotate with a passion project that it it doesn't actually necessarily go anywhere, right? This is a passion project that has just exploded in the best possible way. Um, I was incredibly struck by the comments about David reaching out and sort of hand selecting some people, saying you might connect with this, this might fit with your purpose, this is my purpose, and I see it potentially fitting with your purpose. And really using that interpersonal connection to say, I don't know you that well, but would you be interested in this? And I think that's been critical to your success. And the other thing that I really like, and it relates to the passion piece, is that everyone commented on, David came to them with no idea of what they would be doing, they had no idea, he had no idea, but it was sort of like, okay, let's give this a try. So that kind of adaptability and willingness to just explore and try something without, um, with, with a little bit of a vision, but an unclear vision, and the willingness to say, I'm passionate, let's see where it goes. Um, so I think the challenge for you all is maintaining that momentum um, and remaining that adaptable as you firm up more what you're doing and how you're doing it, maintaining some of that early flexibility and agility that served you so well as your own startup. And, and those of us who study leadership and some of the people in the room are experts on, on uh, strategy and startups. Startups typically end up in the wrong place. They end up somewhere else than, when they, than where they thought they would start up. And in the leadership field, Jim Collins famously said, your first challenge in any endeavor is to get the right people on the bus. The bus can go wherever it needs to go. Get the right people involved, and then you can drive wherever you want to drive. And you can shift, and you can adapt. And I think that's a key to success to any organization, but particularly a student-led organization that you know that you're going to have somewhere between 20 and 50% turnover in any one year, because sooner or later you're going to graduate and go somewhere else. And so connecting that changing world to a larger mission, and, and, the, and the mission is large enough because I think it has more to do with learning and community than I, have, than I do with things, investments. And that allows you to connect with them. Now, Professor Siegel, if there's anything left, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll go this way next time, so you get the, the tip off well, the next question. Um, as I'm going fifth, I'll take a, I'll take a different take. Uh, and I think the question is, why are you here? And the real answer for me is, I have no idea why. <laughs> um, and I was somewhat puzzled when I heard the student speakers say that they didn't have any idea why they were here. Um, so I, I can agree with all the, all the sentiments about passion and, and energy, uh, but I would say as a, as a question or, or a criticism, um, I think most organizations kind of know what, what they want to do. And so I think one of the things that I would focus on is what is the mission? Uh, because in, until you can define the mission, it's very difficult to then define the strategy and following strategy is going to be your set of goals and then following the goals are going to be your, your action plan. So uh, the people that get on the bus kind of want to know where the bus is going. Um, and I'm still not sure, even having sat here now for half an hour, however long it's been, why I'm here or where the bus is going. So I'm here because I got a number of emails that there's some event taking place, I should go, please come, you know, please ship, please help us. And I don't, I don't even know what it is, but okay, I've been in Israel a few times. Sounds like it's related to Israel, so I'll go and see what it's all about. Um, so my, again, my recommendation would be, uh, I think maybe start to crystallize, is this, uh, is this an educational endeavor? Is this an advocacy endeavor? Uh, maybe it's both. But what, what are we doing here? That's my question. And the next thing you know, you end up on a panel. You know yeah. why well, you're I found that out about 10 minutes ago. Perfect. Early. So we're looking for that adaptability. So you're exactly the type of person we want. Um, and that actually is the next question. We don't have to go in order. But given the, the positive vibes um, and some uh, uh, realistic vibes, what recommendations do you have? Um, What's the one thing you would tell the leadership of this organization in year three and a half? In, in, in no. Now, four and a half. Four and a half. In the fourth, in, after the fourth year, <laughs> what recommendation? What one recommendation would you give them, based on what Professor Siegel said, based on the comments, so that you can grow and continue success? 
Well, I, I feel like I do have a good sense of what Tanita is about, um, and in, in part because I've role played enough with you all that <laughs> I have heard how many different pitches explaining what Tanita is about. So I think my advice would be to um, find a way to perhaps better articulate more broadly um, so that more people understand. Um, so if indeed you do, if you have a crystallized vision, how do you make people more aware of that, of that vision? I think publicize how you not just generate it, but publicize, promote it, and get ideas from others. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyone else? Jeff? Or? I just want to echo something or amplify something that, that you uh, said in your introductory remarks. And I, I think you were at Link Day this yeah. year. Yes. Yeah, so um, uh, Jack and I participated in some years with something called Link Day, which is a program put on in the graduate school by the public and nonprofit group. And it's a day of consulting which teams of four or five graduate MBA students provide consulting to nonprofit organizations which apply to come in and they, you know, they get selected and they come in for a day and um, you know, hopefully leave with a better sense of how to address their problems when they came. And the keynote speaker this year um, said something that really resonated with me and, and uh, Jack mentioned it at the start, which is that it's as important or it's, it's as important for any organization to figure out what not to do as it is to figure out what to do. And what this keynote speaker who has started uh, and run a number of significant nonprofits over the years said is that you have to figure out what are the you know what are the few things, what are the two or three things that you were really good at? What can you do that sets you apart? Where you were you were going to be one of the best or you know or worse than the second best doing that in your in your space. Focus on those things. It's very easy, you've got a lot of talented people, a lot of people, a lot of energy. It's very easy to get diffuse. And so you need to you need to really focus on what our mission is and um, how does what we're doing relate to that mission and you know what are the few things we should concentrate on. It can be all things to all people. It's, it's, uh, it, as a small organization, it feels like that's the way somehow, but it comes to a point where you have to focus more. Yeah, I would say I, I take the analogy of you know being a person who played sports in college and played double and triple A baseball for a number of years. Focus on where your real talents are. Sometimes you see coaches and they've got this style of coaching, but it doesn't match the group of people who they have in. And because you have this revolving group of students, you're always going to be changing. You have to really know what your strengths of your students are. It reminds me being in playing double A ball in Macon. And we had this coach who was all about, you know, this team that he wanted a bunch of power hitters. And what he had was a bunch of really fast okay, people who could steal bases and do things. And he kept trying to get folks who were singles and doubles hitters to hit on runs. And thinking, you know, coach, what we got here is a bunch of thoroughbreds, okay? You're treating us like Clydesdales. It ain't going to So you've got this revolving group of people that, as you mentioned, 20 to 50 percent are turning over every year. So assess your talent and say, okay, based on the talent that we have in place, what are some things that we can actually pursue and do really well in and focus on doing those few things well? But sometimes those few things might actually change based on the talent that you have. So being flexible, recognizing the talent pool you have, and that that talent pool is always evolving and changing as well. What did you run the 40 in? Uh, well, like, Four, three, four, wow. four. No yeah, wings on our feet. I'd like to ask the panel for any any semi closing thoughts on what's been said, and then I'll open it up to a couple of questions from the group to the panel, and then I'll invite the second panel up. So, based on what's been said so far, has anything come to mind that you would recommend um, to the to the founding and former president, to the new president, and to the next generation of to be leaders? Do what you like. Like what you do. Well, I guess you know, based on um, some of the things that have already been said, and based on my um, advice already to sort of define what it is you're doing. The other thing I would I would define is I've heard the term success that we're all very pleased with the success you've had so far. So one of the things I, one of the things I would do is define what that means. So what does it mean to be if you're successful? What do you what are you saying that is success? That what in other words what what have you done that demonstrates success? And that will help you again, I think, refine your goals and your mission because then you'll be able to say, okay, if our goal was to grow revenue at 10% and we 
it would go to 12%, then I would know, okay, well that's a definition of successfully achieved something. So what is it that um, defines success? And then the second thing I would uh, focus on is, is something that, that at least three people have mentioned, that is the continuity issue. You have 25% at least turnover. Um, and so I agree that organizations evolve, missions change, organizations pivot, strategies pivot. However, um, whatever it is that you decide and define are your definitions of success and the definition of mission, um, you, you have to be very careful to communicate that and communicate your culture and your values frequently because you're going to make, you need to pass on that passion, those set of values. And the only way to do that is by communicating it frequently to those people that are coming up through the ranks. It's a, it's a very important part of mentoring and maintaining whatever positive culture that you're generating. One of the things we know about family businesses is the third generation that's the problem. Because the first generation, the founder, he or she, they, 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 it's their baby. The second generation is, is the founder's son or daughter, so they saw their... The third generation is distant from that and, and doesn't understand what the success is and why it is. And, and, to, and, to, and to have continuity, you have to talk about the culture, the values, and measure success. Why are we successful? What is it that we want to do? Because the rest of the organization will follow that. Typically, what gets measured gets done, um, to a fault, perhaps. But uh, that's true in any size organization. I want to jump on the word goal for a second. As you're sort of figuring out your strategy moving forward, um, I would encourage you to think about uh, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you see yourself in a few years? Where do you see yourself next year? And not to alter my earlier point about that adaptability, but I think often organizations get mired in what's immediately in front of them. And so I think having some vision about what's a little more long range, middle range, short range, and in the lifetime of a student organization, I think five years is fairly long range, at least as a point to begin. I don't have anything to add to what's been thank you. One or two questions from the, we have a panel of fairly distinguished people, or they one or two questions from the audience. <laughs> Please stand up and enunciate. And, I, and identify yourself. Okay. Hi, my name is Nadav David. I'm actually the president of Tamita Northeastern. Uh, it's a great honor to be here and to see how far Tamita BU has come and really guided us as well. Um, my question is, how do you identify um, leaders in the third generation? So as being the founder, you know, I've, been, I've gone through this for over a year, but, and I've had people beside me who have, you know, like second generation, but how do you really communicate that, um, all that hard work and identify the future uh, leaders of the organization? How do I identify future leaders? I'm going to steal a line from uh, John Kenny's inaugural address. Um, ask not what you want to find people who whose relationship to Tamid is to ask not what Tamid can do for them, but ask what they can do for Tamid. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a lot of students, or sometimes students, get involved in organizations because they they want to have a leadership experience that they can put on their resume. Mm -hmm. um, and that, however talented those people might be, I don't think you build an organization around those people. I don't think those people are concerned with building an organization because they're primarily concerned with building themselves. You need the people who are selfless, whose attitude is, what can I do? Um, and you know, without thinking about what's in it for me, uh, but what can I do? Mm -hmm. And I think that you start cultivating those people early. Um, you start building the next, you know, that third generation, you know, from as soon as they're in the door and you start identifying that they share the passion, that they care, and start drawing them in and giving them, you know, some leadership from within. And then that's how you start to cultivate early on. One of our speakers tonight was a fresh freshman. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to think about that, to, I, I know I. I don't want to talk about what I was like when I was your age, but it was not, it was not as good as maybe it is today. Um, but I couldn't have spoken as eloquently as each of you, but particularly a freshman to come into a group like this and, 
and, and to talk about that, I, I think just uh, what shows that that ability to recruit um, the next generation and, and, to, and to build from that. Any other comments about leadership? Just one short comment, which is um, observe how that person reacts or interacts with other members of the club, both peers and um, people they're mentoring. So that person may have a very good role. The person that you might be looking to as a successor uh, might have a very good relationship with you. But be observant about their relationship with their peers. And if it's someone who's not a freshman, how well they mentor uh, the people that are coming up on you. Thank you. Maybe one more question from the audience. Anyone? Please. Hi, I'm Maddie. I'm a new member in me. I'm also a sophomore in SMG. And my question is, throughout this whole night, I've kept hearing all of you say that the hardest part of a startup or an organization is to continue it, not to actually start it. So I'm wondering, what are suggestions from you guys on how to continue it, to keep it going? I would say keep talking about it. When you have an opportunity to speak with other students about what you're doing, uh, speak about it in an intelligent, enthusiastic, uh, purposeful way. So they get a grasp of what it is you're doing, and they also in, breathe enthusiasm about being involved in it as well. But you have to talk about it. And you, you say advertisement or whatever else it is, but you have to let people know and get the word out. It's like when you have a new product, and they give out samples out here on Commonwealth Avenue. Well, you didn't know they had watermelon lemonade gum until they gave out some free samples of it. You said, hmm, that actually tastes pretty good. So you got to talk about it, you got to advertise it, you got to let people know what's out there and let them come to events that you're doing and invite them around. So you, you have to do advertisement, that's important, getting the word out, no doubt. Other comments from the panelists? Okay, well, um, I think this has been a nice discussion to give you a sense uh, and so I think some very tangible ideas, both uh, celebratory and um, uh, critical of what we need to do going forward. So please join me in, what, in thanking and the very first uh, strategy <laughs> for the Thank you very much for your time and for your generosity of spirit and wisdom. How about wisdom? <laughs> Thank you very much. And with that, I would like to invite up our second panel, which is just as important as the first panel. And I would like to invite Professor Spieler, Professor Parker, and Dean Eisenberg from the School of Engineering. Redundancy, I will start by asking, why are you here? And just to, to give the group a sense of why you're here, and it's completely okay if you don't know why you're here. We've got at least one panelist who's already said that. So, why are you here, uh, and what brings you to us tonight? Starting in the, in the I, I will. I will. Uh, the last person that sat this chair said the exact same thing I'm going to say. I'm, I'm the same way. I was. Uh, I was marketed to very well, and I was curious to know what this is all about. And so I came here probably with the idea of not really understanding why I was here, but uh, that I was going to learn something new. Nice. And if you, if you think why we're all here, this is a university, so the spirit, the curiosity to learn, you're more likely to get people to come like that than maybe quote unquote in the real world. So 
I don't, I don't know Mr. Dinesh, but I know Shira, and she was very persuasive. Yes. <laughs> wow, I feel like I've been around since David started um, pitching this idea. Um, so I feel very invested um, in supporting the group, but also um, the personal invitation goes a long way with me. So um, Shira and David showed up at the office and said, hey, we're going to invite you to this, so be sure to come. And because I want to be supportive of um, Tamid, and I'm super impressed with what they've done, I wanted to be good to support them. Well, at the risk of some big redundancy, it's David who brought me here tonight. Um, David is a student in one of my classes, and uh, not only did he invite me here to learn more about the group, but he has helped me to get two guest speakers who are also going to teach you this semester. So, thank you, David. Wow. wow. So, a quick pro quo. So, David has been helping behind the scenes. <laughs> and I'm here because of, I don't know David, I don't know Shira. Uh, I've seen some of their emails that Daniel, uh, one of the two engineers in this organization, came to me and uh, pitched it. And then I was actually not going to be, I wasn't in for the first schedule, and then I got rescheduled, and when I was able to come. I have a long uh, history with the state of Israel and um, uh, supportive of uh, things that are related to science and technology. Well, we're delighted you could come. This is not, this is, many of the members of Tamir are, are in the School of Management, but it's a university-wide organization, and, and we're, we're especially delighted that, that the School of Engineering is, is here with us as well. Well, Daniel indicated to me that he would like to see more engineers. Yeah. <laughs> support from the dean's office. <laughs> 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 I think those are relationships that we don't build as well as we could. But if you think one role of the School of Management is to help connect across the functional and technical boundaries, and that's not an area we do as well as we could. So, uh, so I think this is an important relationship. I'll ask the, the second question in a broader way, so, you, so as you're not so redundant. I'd like you to think about student organizations that maybe you've seen in the past, maybe you've been involved with in the past, maybe uh, you've read about in the past. Um, what are the types of things that you think student organizations need to survive and grow? Broadly defined, that might be helpful for the people in the room. Well, I'll be happy to offer a few thoughts if I may lead mm -hmm. off here. Uh, I know earlier tonight all the speakers talked about the club doing some consulting work for companies. In my view, that's like the most important thing you can do is to sort of donate your time, your knowledge, your talent whether it's a startup company or a company that's been around for a while, because they will be singing your praises and they will basically give you the ability to continue this group. I mean, I think it's a very, very noble thing you're doing. I'd like to learn more about it, but uh, the ability to take talent and to bring it outside the walls of BU, I think that is a huge thing in terms of the strength of the organization. Other members of the panel, keys to success. I think I probably come from a slightly different background than most of the, the people on the panel. Um, my background and my current role is, is working in academic and student affairs. Um, and so I was an activities director at one point and most recently worked with the other student organizations within SMG. So I look at it more from the pure student organization standpoint and the continuity of an organ true student organization. So hopefully I'm not limiting my response, but I think um, one of the things um, when we talk about the case study, David referred to that earlier, um, that has impressed me is that you have a lot of the things I think that do help an organization continue um, in place, and the key is passing the torch mm -hmm. now for you. Um, the personal I think the personal investment of your members is incredible, and I think that stems partly from the selectivity that you have in your organization. You don't make it easy for people to come and go. Um, you get people invested quickly, and I love the example that when you recruited your first group of directors, you immediately gave them a task to do as a group, to bond them and to have them feel invested in, this, in the success of the organization. And I really do think that having that investment by 
each successive class is going to be super helpful for you in terms of continuity. And the other part of it is that you, you mentor your peers, and not a lot of organizations do that well. So just the fact that you all are teaching your own education curriculum, you haven't invited in the experts <laughs> um, in the form of professors or staff members or anything like that. You're teaching each other about these things. And so that's further helping the next generation feel invested. Um, so I, I like that you're, you're mentoring the peers too. And it's not a secret, the best way to learn something is to teach it. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you are learning your business, financial, and operational techniques through the teaching process much more than you would learn in our classrooms. So, so I, I echo that. Yeah, I, thank you. Uh, I could probably go on for about 20 minutes on this topic, but I, I will refrain. Um, I personally am the advisor for three groups here at BU. Um, I wish my groups were as good as this one, okay? Um, I'll tell you that right off the bat. Uh, a few things about the success. First of all, I agree we've talked about the success in planning. Uh, one thing is definitely to be your advisor. Because if your advisor stays as the transition among your students changes, the, your advisor is the person that's going to be still here and kind of the rock behind the, the group as far as kind of keeping it, uh, keeping it grounded. And ideally, if the advisor knows what your goals are, then, you know, if the advisor kind of sees uh, nothing going on, which is, what, which is what my situation is, my situation is I was asked to be advisor for a couple of groups, and again, it was the first generation, uh, there was a person like Dinesh, Mr. Dinesh, um, that was very passionate, and, but now that that person's left as a senior, the, the next group has really, is floundering, and they're not really, I mean, uh, the new executive board has not yet come to see me at all, despite my email. So I couldn't even tell you who's even on this book. It's kind of embarrassing, okay? Uh, so that's, that, that's a big thing, I think, to do that and, and to understand. And I think uh, in terms of what will help you, again, uh, having more concrete goals, that was said before, but I think one thing that will really help you is the, you know, I mean, a lot of clubs are known for certain things. So certainly, if there's events that you have that are annual things, that's gonna help you. So if you, have, if you know you're gonna have a guest speaker to do something that's to me sponsored, blah, 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 in February, every year that's what you have, and then you kind of be known for that, and, and gets you reputation. And certainly if you want to have more involvement with the community, it's gonna help you get more credibility where you go. Um, certainly as far as your success in planning, as we've already talked about, get people involved early. You know, subgroups, right? So you have someone, you know, if you're the executive team and then you've got something to do with a freshman or a sophomore and they have a small group to do something, then you know, to give them leadership roles in, a, in the group. Um, and also maybe what you want to do is, uh, you know, for some of the younger underclassmen, sophomore and freshmen, you know, talk to them and say, okay, you as freshmen, what do you want to do by the time you're a senior? You can start working on that now because obviously it is going to transition someone, right? I mean, things that David did today aren't necessarily going to be the goals of the group four years from now. It does need to be a little bit, you know, transitional. To engage the generations in their own destiny, to, to ask them and to, and to work with them, that mentoring, that mentoring strategically as well as operationally. Yeah, that's the cautionary tale, I think, is self-perpetuation is necessary, but not sufficient. You can continue an organization and make sure that you have the, the leadership and cultivation and, and forget what you're about. Very few years, and still be successful in the sense that you have the membership and you can sustain it. But I think the mission was talked about before, making sure that, that you have goals and definitions of what success are and how you will measure that success um, is going to be important as you grow. How big you, should you be? How big you need to be? And that presumably is going to be related to the mission that you need to fulfill or are destined to. Other comments? I want to echo what Professor Parker said about advisors being, I, I always forget, and I shouldn't because I'm supposed to be the advisor to a number of organizations, um, but I agree with that. Get your, I, I, I'm sure Annette is wonderful, um, <laughs> and I know you've had an advisor change because somebody left, but really seek that person out and get them invested too. I'm 
I'm likewise the advisor to organizations of people I've never even seen or met, despite sending out email after email after email. And I've contacted advisors for organizations in my previous role, and they've said, oh, I haven't heard from those people in five years. I don't even know if they still exist. So definitely, I would, I would echo that from having been on the side of overseeing the groups. <coughs> Uh, let me flip the, qu the question around, um, and, and not to uh, move towards anything on a negative note, but kiss of death, what's the type of things that they shouldn't do? That, that if you had a chance to give the advice to the current and future management team of this organization, what, we talked earlier about deciding what not to do. What not to do, what advice would you give these young people? What shouldn't you do, and we've already heard some of that, but that's my next question. What not to do? Um, I have a couple of thoughts. I guess one is maybe not to take for granted that things will happen in the organization. I mean, I've uh, been in a lot of different groups. I, I come here from industry and uh, been on a lot of committees. I've been chair of committees. And what I've always found is that uh, you assume that there's inertia and that things will get done and you know, things will happen, things will be on schedule. And of course it does not unless you assign people and have people you know, with specific responsibility for certain things. Yeah, but let me flip that a bit to the positive about you know not make, making sure that you you have enough of continuity and you have people assigned to do certain things. But I think would be a very interesting uh, approach is if you I know you have some outside speakers you've already brought in before. You could almost make that a cornerstone of the organization that, that every other month you have a speaker come to campus who is not an academic to talk about something related to business or related to you know multiple you know, different fields as represented by the, the different majors in the, in the group. And then you can have your, your team, uh, that, that's their goal, is to find these outstanding speakers to come to campus and to speak. So if nothing else, that's sort of one thing the group gets known for, is for identifying and bringing to campus sort of outstanding speakers that benefit all your members and maybe uh, anyone at large here at BU would like to come to, you know, to these sessions. Other comments? I think, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of organizations fizzle out, student organizations specifically, not business or industry, but um, a couple of things that come to mind for groups that have had that happen is not being agile, mm. um, not being willing to change, um, having a leader who is too focused on their own special interests, um, and not as in not as concerned about engaging the rest of the group and I think um, that the third thing left my mind <laughs> so I'll have to come back to that. I would, I would definitely echo that as well I mean certainly having we've talked about the success of plan mm -hmm. but very often I've found that there are uh, individuals particularly in the senior year they're 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 enjoying the club they're getting a lot out of it and then they aren't really so concerned about the succession plan yeah. Certainly, they, they, they may at one point, okay, so and so is going to take this club after I leave. But after they've kind of appointed that person, they're kind of they're, they're kind of checked out. And it doesn't sound like you guys are doing that at all. So that sounds great. So I truly think, you know, again, rather than the question of what not to do, I'm telling you another thing to do is to, I would definitely encourage you to continue, you know, certainly in the spring semester, if that's when you have your tra transition period, is that, you know, while, while the, the, the old regime, so to speak, is still in place. The new one comes in and then uh, have a strategy session and then have a new set of goals. Okay, you know, now I'm president of the club and this is what I think we should do for the, you know, this is my objectives. I think we should go for the upcoming year, two years, and have that always be going. I mean, any, you know, we're all from business, we all talk about business. I mean, most businesses have a long-term plan, a, a medium-range plan, a short-term short -term plan. So, so it's all a planning. So what, what again, if I look at the long-term growth or the long-term mantra, if you will, that is maybe the speakers every month or whatever, this thing you're known for doing, which everybody knows, um, and then, okay, this is, these are our short-term goals that we're gonna do and the consulting, and then what do you wanna do? So it's always, you know, keeping everybody engaged and making sure, um, you know, it's, it's not a dictatorship. You, you know, you have to buy in from the people that you are, you're with, you get your smile, so I must have hit a nerve, right? <laughs> so, yeah, but, it's, but, but, but it, I mean, that's true. I mean, it's going to be part of the group, and, and I think, you know, and uh, and just like anything else, it's, it's a hard decision. If there are people, 
even of the leadership role, if they're not performing, then you can make a change. It's like anything else. I mean, you're, you're a small, you're 25 people, that's still relatively small. And it, you know, it's very close knit, so you be careful because it's going to be like, you know, a bunch of people share in the same bathroom. So you know, so you care about those personalities. <laughs> Any other comments from the panel? I remember number three. Oh, number three. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I took, why I took so long. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate Thank that. You. It helped. Um, don't, I, I read this great little book once, you don't have to do it alone. Um, don't burn any one person out or let any one small group of people get burnt out. Don't rely too heavily on one little group of people who are then going to want to run in the other direction after you exhaust them. Closing comments before I ask for a couple of questions from the audience. I think we've covered it all, right? Let's hear a few questions. Mm -hmm. One or two questions to the panel. Please identify yourself. Uh, my name is Hasko Tayakashi. I'm Vice President of Operations here at Tamid, and uh, I'm also a, a junior at SMG. Um, one of the things I was reminded of listening to you for and the other uh, panelists was what I once heard in Professor McCarthy's uh, lecture is that leaders are not born, they are made. So in your professional careers, how have you guys uh, made leaders? What do you see in them and how can we use that um, advice as we continue to transition and create new leaders? What a great question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And by leaders, I'm, I'm assuming you also mean continuity in the club. I know that's been a consistent theme here tonight. Yes. Uh, I think, in my experience, how do you create a leader? You give them a really tough assignment and let them see how they do. And you step back. And when they, you're there to catch them when they, when they really fall big time. But you let them try it and you let them succeed and just keep doing it over and over again. I mean, it's, it's, I agree with you. Leadership cannot be taught. It has to be sort of, you know, you, you sort of pick it up by osmosis, by a series of successes and failures. So I'm sure your group will be, uh, be the same way. You know, you, to, to inspire and develop your leaders, you've got to assign them something that's a really tough task and see how they do it. I think it's a combination of uh, exerting passion, three Ps, if you will. Uh, exerting passion, but also having the ability and the smarts to listen. Obviously, a good leader is not, again, the dictator is not, it's not someone that's going to push through, but is more going to sell, you know, sell their ideas and get, and get agreement and, and get collaboration. So that's probably a big part of it. So being able to uh, be inclusive, again, a group of 25, you, you know, it's, it's not going to take much uh, dissension in a group to have big problems, right? So certainly, you know, even if you have half, you have 10 people say, I don't like, I don't like the way the club's going, you're going to be drunk. So I think uh, you got to, you know, Make sure we're kind of all in agreement, and a good leader is going to bring everybody to the fold, have a good discussion, and be willing to admit when you make a mistake. And you know, and again, what, what, what's the objective? Is the objective for the leader to get uh, feel good about it, or is the objective for the group to really, you know, uh, embrace their core values and their, you know, their mission? I think you asked how have we made good leaders, and I won't to have made any good leaders, um, but hopefully have um, helped some students discover um, the leadership characteristics that they had. And I like to think of it um, as an elaboration of what my colleagues have said in that you have to be supportive when, when students fall down or, or leaders, or potential leaders fall down. But in addition, taking that a step further, really helping with critical examination of what happened. I really like to break down um, and have talk through, like, why did this work? Why didn't this work? I think processing is, I guess that's the word I'm looking for, really processing um, the different scenarios in, as a form of support to help students learn, a, you know, the infamous teachable moment. Um, and taking advantage of that, taking the time to recognize it and take advantage of it, I think is really important as you hand off the mantle. Yeah, I, th I didn't hear the word mentorship. And I think that, that leaders are mentored by current leadership. Um, I, I think that that's, you know, you start, I think you start small and you build up and within a group leaders emerge 
from those kinds of experiences, and then they, they mature, they grow, and they're able to take on bigger tasks, and they're, they're stepping up to do that, and you're comfortable with them doing it. I think it's not just throwing, you know, throwing an open bridge. When we study leaders, particularly in our entrepreneurial ventures, we look back at them and we realize that over the course of their careers, they don't, successful leaders don't succeed more frequently than others. They fail more frequently than others. But they have this ability to dust themselves off and most importantly, learn from the failure. And so the worst thing you can do is create an environment where failure is punished. Um, and, and certainly, you can think about healthcare and there's certain industries where, where the, you, you can't have failure in certain operations. But you want an environment that's tolerant of failure to the point of people willing to take risk and willing to take a challenging assignment and, and, and interested in stretching themselves in ways that they will grow. If you can predict what people are going to do under certain circumstances, you, they're not stretching enough because you can't predict. You, can't, you think about the best success you've had. It's something that you yourself might have not thought possible. And so when you think about leadership, it's about creating an organization where people are willing to take risks, they're willing to stretch themselves, and they're willing to put themselves in uncomfortable positions for the good of the group. And I think that's what everyone uh, here has been saying. So um, I can't think of two better models for that thus far than having David and having Shira. The, the, the different personalities, but that same notion of being willing to try this. We'll try this, and if it doesn't work, then we'll do that. And that notion of resilience, and, and I think each of the panelists have said that. Um, do we have a closing question? Well, with that, let me thank the panelists. The, the, the comments and your energy. Um, and if you would return back to the group, we've got a few minutes that I'd like to uh, uh, pull, pull together a group discussion before we break for dessert and some other things, some coffee. Okay? Yeah, we'll do this a little, little exercise first. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you to the panelists. So we've got a couple of minutes before I want to break, and I'd like to capture some of the energy. And I said I did not want this to be just a, a boring panel, and it was not. It actually was a very interesting panel, and I think a panelist uh, did that. But I'd like to capitalize on some of that, and I want you involved because this is a strategy session. This is not a speech. It's not a conversation. So what I would like is for the next five minutes, I want you to turn to the person next to you, and if there's an odd number of people in your row, pick up your chair and move it. I'd like you to pick up your chair and turn to the person as if you care about this, whatever they're saying, as if you do, and I'd like you to say the one thing I took away from this panel discussion that I thought was really interesting and important was. The one thing that I thought was interesting and important from this panel discussion, what people said was, and I want each of you to talk about that. And the other person should say something like, wow, that's interesting, why do you think that? <laughs> okay, is that hard? Five minutes in total, that gives you two or three minutes each. Figure out who your partner is, it's better if it's someone you don't know. Get up, move around, do what you see. And what I'd like you to tell me is what you found interesting about the other person said. We definitely weren't clear. What'd you find interesting? Go. Uh, my friend Sarah over here was explaining uh, how important it is to have a community like if you are in a leadership position to keep doing it until the end and even after you're not in a leadership position, which I think uh, David Mayberg and David Desher will be graduating or doing a great job and do it. And, and Andrew, yes, sorry, control C. Um, so, I think, uh, uh, so I think that's a really good example uh, because they were speaking from previous experience and other groups they're involved in um, and how that kind of like hurt the entire group. So I think that's really important. Yeah, here's, the secret, here's one secret to success, think about leadership at every level. The, that it's very easy to say, oh, those are the leaders and they screwed up or they did these good things, these bad things. Um, and one of the comments is, what about the leaders at every level? 
Um, and how can I be leading, doing whatever it is I'm doing as a freshman, as a you know, to have leadership throughout the organization? Good. Other interesting ideas. Who's got something? Hi. So um, I'm going to be VP of programming, and we're and your name is Simona. Hi, Simona. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so I just told Andrew that this whole conversation kind of made me thinking like we need really. We spoke about this, we brainstormed about this, but I think we really need to implement a mentorship program within ourselves. Um, so for the juniors and seniors who have been in this group for two, whatever, a year, almost two years, um, for them to really take that all of the next member and really take them under their wing. And I think we're sort of doing that now with um, from like VP and directors and kind of, um, interlocking them, but I think on top of that, we need um, kind of more like a social aspect, like, hey, let's go to coffee, hey, let's have dinner here tonight, let's travel to the North End and grab a bite. So I think we need kind of more of like a, more of a social aspect on top of everything. Or maybe more holistic, it doesn't have to be yes. social, but yes. just not at the business meeting, but outside of outside um, I think John Quincy Adams, one of, the, uh, one of our presidents, son of a president said, the responsibility of leaders is to develop more leaders. That that's, that's the role, um, is to think of how do I develop the next generation of leaders? Well, we'll get to know them and, and, and show them the types of things that you are interested in and then listen to their ideas, because um, that is the next generation. Good, who's got other ideas? What do you got? Well, I'm Hannah, I'm a founding member, and Sarah Rocky and I, just to echo what Simona was saying, um, we were talking about that, that mentoring would be such a beneficial thing to have in this group because we don't want to lose the passion that you know David and the founding members and the board started off with and I think that's something with continuity how do we ensure that um, our future leaders the third generation fourth generation years to come that to me is still you know have the same values that it was created with so I think having that mentorship and you know seeking the values or instilling the values in the new members is really crucial for any organization. Well, as you were talking, one thing I was thinking about is remember, um, some of these people are leaving, they're not dying. So, <laughs> so where are they going? They're going into industry, they're going into jobs, they're going into places where their lives in many ways are more interesting than they are now. Um, so you can keep them involved when they have a responsible job and maybe the passion of whatever organization is lucky enough to have them and lucky enough to have Shira. Maybe those organizations will say, this is kind of interesting, and we have the senior manager of this or this vice president of engineering who might want to come talk. And so to use your network beyond being a senior, so that 20 years from now to be an alum of Tamid is something that's valuable too. So to extend, that's a great idea. To extend the life. Idea. Uh, other ideas? Hi, I'm Andrew. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? So I was the director of consulting, or still am. Yeah. Um, I think what we what I learned is definitely about turnover. Um, I know that I'm graduating with second semester senior. It all goes well. All goes well. <laughs> uh, and I basically built the educational program for consulting out of scratch. Like, to me, it does have one, but we weren't given those resources prior to starting. So I created something based on the tools and the skill sets that I think the new students coming in would have that I could teach them and they could do well. So now I think. Um, we, we developed a survey to get feedback on the education, see what was good, what wasn't good. But I think we're like adapting to think, like especially the education you know, program is definitely not concrete right now. It's always going to be adapting based on what prior generations have learned, what what, what worked well, and what didn't. We definitely definitely take that into account. Maybe as Professor Siegel said, measure what what is success? How successful were you with that? Maybe, maybe you felt good about doing something, but maybe the audience right. didn't learn it. Um, and so how do you capture that? How do you measure that? And, that, and how do you institutionalize it? Right, I want to make sure that when I leave in a few months that whoever's taking over knows exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, maybe you, maybe you might, out of the kindness of your heart, maybe you might volunteer to help out a little bit. Mm -hmm. When you're in industry and when you, when you can have context, say, oh my god, this is a better example than the one we used it to me. Right. That would be even better. Good. One or two more, please. Or, uh, Professor Laura. Good my to see you. Zori, see you. Uh, I think one interesting idea would be that just to really connect to a lot of the other groups around here, not only to see like things that they're doing well, but also to see things that they're not doing well. Mm -hmm. And so really just learn from them. And I know we try to do that, but we could definitely do that at a higher level. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, you, you, to, to, to talk with other leaders, peers, people who are in other organizations, and, and not to be an investigative reporter or a spy, but, but to ask, what is your, how are you successful, and how do you get members? And, and think about all the organizations that are happening at BU that you can learn from. Or, God forbid, Northeastern, or other schools. That everyone's connected in that sense. You can learn from each other. And I, and I hope that BU wins the hockey game at the Bean Plus next month. <laughs> be clear, you're welcome to stay all evening, but uh, I really hope you're feasting losers. Well, someone else had a hand up. Hi, I'm Samantha. Hi, Samantha. Um, I, I, I kind of got concerned when the professor sat here and said that he didn't know why he was here. Like, is there a mission? Well, what is that mission? And it got me thinking that I don't think that there necessarily needs to be an end goal or or we don't even have we don't there is no end goal and I think that's what makes us so like honestly cool like it's <laughs> it's fascinating and it's motivating and it's honestly so fulfilling to always have something to strive for mm. and always keep reaching for the next best thing and I feel like our track record and me just being a new member and seeing our track record is we don't Fail. We don't, and we always do reach what we set out to, and I think that it's cool to just hear all this stuff and gonna keep going for it, keep mm -hmm. going for the goal. I know when I do consulting, I you know I, I talk about the tension between creativity and structure. That that you need structure and you need goals and you need missions, but you need to have an environment where it is creative and you feel excited about going to work, or in this case, coming to be part of an organization. You should want to be here. If you go to a meeting with these people and it's a boring, miserable meeting, you should tell them that. And say, this is boring and miserable. That's not why I joined. That doesn't mean that this is not the Barney School of Management. Everyone doesn't get a big hug. Um, right? Uh, it's okay to do boring stuff and to be tough. But it should be interesting and fun. And that's the spirit you want when you're a senior. I'm sorry to keep speaking, but Sam just made me think of something. Um, I was a founding member, I was one of the directors, so I think for Timmy, we, we have an evolving goal. It's never the same, because I remember being a founding director, our goal was to get applicants, just one person to apply. We didn't think we would have 13 applicants that are so dedicated and you know already having leadership positions. I can't even tell you how proud I am to have Zoe and Maddie, who literally organized this entire event. So that was our goal, at least last year, and now we have different goals, and I think that's something that's about to be in our growth is that we're constantly evolving. So to me last year isn't the same to me we have this year, but you know, we all came into to me maybe for different reasons. I personally wanted to find a way to kind of shine a different light on Israel rather than what most people think of the conflict because people overlook that, you know, the startup nation that it is. So I think that we're constantly evolving and we're constantly growing and to me we don't know what to me is going to be next year, but we know we're going to be on a different step than we are today. Well, one thing I can say is, is your parents probably told you that you're defined by your friends, like who you hang out with um, makes you who you are, and you look who your friends are and, and who the faculty are in the room, and these are not schmucks. <laughs> like, like the people in the room are really talented and really good at what they do, and they choose to belong to certain organizations. And you choose to be here, and so creating an organization where good people want to be part of it um, is the secret sauce. I also just want to add in what I think makes to me so special and what takes it to like the next level of going from a club to an organization is the passion that everyone in this club has behind it. I don't think anyone here can understand how much passion David and Shira have for this club. They, I've seen it, it's really yeah, frightening. They want to be up until 5 a.m. to do this. So they don't want to because it's a task. They want to do it because they want to do everything they can to make this organization the best it can be. And I had Professor Allen last semester, and I think he brought this lesson um, or idea into my head that everything's driven by passion, but until I joined this organization and saw what it's capable of, I don't think I realized that that's actually true. That's a wonderful lesson. Well, that's sir. why we come well, to university, sir. to see these things. <laughs> so very well said. Um, maybe that should be one of the last things that are said. Um, and again, I suppose this is the Barney School of Management. We end with a big hug. Uh, but I think that's the right thing. I think we begin with that, we end it with that, with a lot of advice in between about do your homework, measure success, don't be satisfied, be different, be bold, be creative, and, and move it to the next generation. 
Um, we will follow up with a survey, but this is just the beginning. We want more data. Um, and I think it'll be one or two questions, not, not a big exhaustive survey. But I think the management team wants to capture some of the data, that having a conversation like this is valuable, um, but we don't want it just to dissipate. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to David, uh, to you three. Um, and I thank you for being part of this. And most of all, I thank the panelists uh, to be part of this, some of them with literally a moment's notice. <laughs> Um, to be uh, on a panel in front of a group of people is not an easy thing to do, so congratulations and thank you very much. Thank you. We just uh, really, really, really want to express our thanks for not only your advice, your mentorship, but your 100% commitment to this group. Um, most people don't know this, but the professor actually canceled a personal commitment to be here tonight. That is something that we really uh, cannot make up to you. We were so thrilled when you told us that you were visiting Israel last summer. We're just so happy that you're now connected to the group, that you understand you know, Israel on the ground, you know, really enhances your under the understanding of what this group is. And that we would just hope that you know, we can continue this amazing relationship that uh, you have with this group for many generations, that when David and I come back as alumni of this university, that we might not recognize the faces of Tamid, but we will know that our advisor, Ned McBride, and that Dean Reiser, and uh, you will still be here, you know, watching over what hopefully, you know, David and, you know, the rest of us have been able to uh, really uh, create. So without further ado, we'd like to present you with this gift um, signed by every member in this media organization. Wow. Um, and we Thank just uh, hope as a reminder, just, you know. <laughs> The best in Israel t shirt. <laughs> Everyone signed it. It's beautiful. For once in my life, I'm speechless. <laughs> and, and all joking aside, having gone to Israel, the fact that the word passion comes up is all the time. Uh, Israelis and, and people in that part of the world are just so passionate, it's infectious. So I'm honored and delighted to be part of the group. Uh, I admire your work and I look forward to working with you well into the future. So please keep up the good work and, and thank you for this, for this. This is wonderful. Um, everyone, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, it was really a pleasure. I think that all of us, especially the members of Tumi, got out a lot. Um, we're going to be closing right now. I'm about to turn it over to the founder the uh, past president, the mentor, and my personal friend, David Dinesh, to close the event. I'm making sure you guys have been saying for an hour and a half now. Um, I, I wanted to I guess, address a few things uh, a few of the professors said during the panel um, and leave with some words of encouragement. Um, I really enjoyed what Professor Siegel said before about not knowing our mission or like where's the bus going? Um, and I realized that our group is very much um, addicted to the story of how we began. Um, but that's not what we've been doing for the past year, uh, and especially this past semester. The majority of our work this semester is consulting for Israeli startups, and Roy, with his team of five, I believe, is teaching them about finance. That's what we do on a weekly basis. Um, but it also depends on who we're speaking to. Um, depends on the faces and, and um, who you represent and to who may be. So for example, to a professor, we're looking for an advisor. We're looking for someone that wants to give us advice and to come to our meetings and maybe educate us. When it comes to other chapters around the country, our goal is to be intimidating <laughs> and to take these pictures and look very scary and look very successful. <laughs> when it comes to our donors, we have to look very professional. Um, so it depends. Um, and to our members, I think the face that I try to put on and I think we're trying to put to each other, which Sarah puts, puts very eloquently all the time, is hashtag to meet family. Um, I think that's over anything else, that's our goal. Um, that family feeling, that enjoyment of coming into a meeting from 6 to 9 on a Wednesday night and saying, I'm comfortable here. I enjoy the people I'm around. I feel like I'm significant. I feel, I feel like I'm belo I belong. I feel like I'm growing in this. Uh, environment and that that's the goal when it comes to our members. And I would say as part of the e-board a lot of your focus is caring about what the members feel and the interaction they have and the experience they have so that's that's one of their missions I would say as, as an e-board 
Um, as a project manager, as a director of consulting, um, I would say their goal is to satisfy our clients. It's our first time consulting. We hope we're doing a good job. There's been some bumps, but that's expected. But our goal is to satisfy our clients, which is the CEO of Oyster at the moment, and investor David Goodrich. And I would say an overarching goal, I'm not, obviously not, I'm not hitting every point of each face that we kind of represent ourselves to and the missions we have or, or success for each one and, and the measures of each. But another goal of ours is to kind of strengthen that business alliance between Boston and Israel, whatever that may be. If it's doing a strategy and marketing campaign for El Al through NEIBC and David Guthrie, if it's having or somehow connecting uh, Professor McCarthy to the CJP and finding a way to get in there. Um, however, we can, however way we can make that happen is, is one of our goals. Um, hitting the topics of transitioning, um, I would say Andrew's doing a great job in that. Um, so, something I would say, something that I was kind of not comfortable hearing for the past hour and a half is my name over and over again. Um, it's simply not true. We're a group of 25. Um, the 25 of us are the ones that are doing the hard work. I may have been the one that's been knocking on doors for a little bit, but that doesn't mean that you know Isaac and Jason weren't doing the ski trip and being able to, you know find a ski resort and finding a bus and setting that all up. Um, and kind of hitting off Sam's point but in a different way, um, we were planning to have a ski trip um, February 8th, so like a week and a half ago. Um, I wouldn't say we failed, but because of weather conditions, we didn't go. <laughs> it, took, it took three months of planning and rigorous work from Jason, Isaac, Shira, and others, um, but it didn't work out. And I think that has to do with innovation. And uh, when we innovate, we don't get the outcome we want always at the first try. And um, I, I think the people closest to the work uh, of the work with me, they've seen um, I've failed and our team has failed over and over and over again. Um, I would say out of all of the activities we've tried to do, probably 30 to 40% has actually uh, succeeded. Um, and you guys get to see like the success. But there's been a lot of you know times where you know like our faces are right in the mud and things weren't working out. But I, I, one of the messages I want to send to the rest of this chapter, and I would say they would agree with me, is just keep trying. You know, I, I think you guys know we try to be an entrepreneurial group. If you have an idea, go for it. If you want it, like Brandon, if you want to make a soccer club a team happen, go for it. Um, that's the goal. You know, to make this a place where you feel like you can bring your creativity in and, and have others enjoy it with you. I, I don't want to, I guess, go through every single member here and talk about how they're important and what they've done. Um, but I do want to quickly explain that I did not do anything on my own. Um, I've never done a project where I didn't have someone else working with me. Um, I never did something where I kept it quiet to myself. Um, and I feel very uncomfortable being here at my, up to, at myself. I thought David was supposed to be with me. Um, but <laughs> it's really, um, it, it never was me. Um, it's never going to be one person. An event like this doesn't happen with one person, it happens with 25. Um, and I think a reason of why we hope to only accept around 16 again next semester or next year is for the goal of keeping this place in the community. And the goal is that each member that comes in knows that they have to play an active role. You know, If you're not an e-board member, you may be a director. If you're not a director, you are a project manager. If you're not a project manager, you've done something before or you're doing something on the side. Um, and that's really the goal. The goal is to feel significant, Feel the belonging, feel the growth. So my last word, um, and I'll say goodnight, is <laughs> the majority of my work and the work of, I guess, David and I, has, and Andrew as well, has been uh, self and professional development. That's really been the goal. Um, and it's a student club, and we're not making money, whatever it may be, but as long as you're developing the people under you and your friends, this group will continue. Thank you.